I want you to hit me as hard as you can. At this point, the history of the Bat franchise circa 1997 is well chronicled. Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin released to critical lashing and fan disappointment. While not a complete commercial failure, the film would underperform for parent company Warner Brothers by only making just under $240 million worldwide, almost $100 million less than its 1995 predecessor, Batman Forever, and a far cry from the series peak of Tim Burton's Batman 89, which was the highest grossing film of the year. Warner Brothers took this as a sign to change directions with the franchise, and what would follow would be an odyssey that would see the franchise absent from the big screen until 2005. The first step in that odyssey would actually be a continuation of the current franchise, i.e. Batman 5. Schumacher told Variety in early 1998, I felt I had disappointed a lot of older fans by being too conscious of the family aspect. I'd gotten tens of thousands of letters from parents asking for a film their children could go to. Now I owe the hardcore fans the Batman movie they would love me to give them. Schumacher was said to have been using Frank Miller's Batman Year One comic as tonal inspiration for Batman 5. George Clooney was under contract to return for another film, but rumors still swirled that Kurt Russell was poised to inherit the role, despite denials from producer John Peters. For what it's worth, Clooney himself stated he was returning. Telling E! News, he said, If there is another, I'd do it. I have a contract to do it. It'd be interesting to get another crack at it to make it different or better. I'll take a look at Batman and Robin again in a couple of months. I got the sense that it fell short, so I need to go back and look at it, see what I could have done better. Reports of what this film was vary, and at the time, the rumor mill churned on the daily. Due to the constant chatter around the film, it's difficult to parse what were true insider scoops from what were clickbait shots in the dark. The title of the first iteration of the film was Batman Unchained, sometimes referred to as Batman Triumphant. Reportedly, the plot of Unchained included at-the-time new villain Harley Quinn, with this iteration being Jack Nicholson's Joker's daughter seeking revenge on Batman for her father's death years prior. The film would also utilize Scarecrow and his fear toxin to torment the caped crusader by supposedly causing hallucinations of all his past villains, including Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Two-Face, and Riddler, with their respective actors reprising their roles. There is some weight to this rumor, as Nicholson told the press, the Joker is coming and it's no laughing matter. Rumored casting for Harley Quinn included Madonna and Courtney Love. While Scarecrow had Nicolas Cage, John Travolta, Howard Stern, or Jeff Goldblum all rumored at one point. Batman Dark Knight was a separate iteration of Batman 5, and did include Scarecrow, but also included Man Bat and had Harley Quinn in more of a cameo role to become a villain in subsequent sequels. Reportedly, Schumacher was not attached to direct this iteration, a further sign that the studio was looking for an even more drastic change. Thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, like this video and click on the bell to receive notifications every time a new one goes up. Now, back to the show. In the summer of 1999, Warner Brothers reached out to up-and-coming filmmaker Darren Aronofsky to pitch his take on the Batman franchise. This step would eventually lead to the hard reboot of the property by tossing out the continuity that began with Burton's 89 Batman. While reboots are now commonplace in Hollywood, at the time, the word did not exist in mainstream lexicon. Regardless, Aronofsky pitched his reboot to Warner Brothers. According to Aronofsky, his idea was Clint Eastwood as the Dark Knight and shoot it in Tokyo, doubling for Gotham City. While that pitch was only half serious, it got the studio's attention and immediately announced itself as a tonal 180 from where the franchise was. Elaborating further on his pitch, the Batman franchise had just gone more and more back towards the TV show, so it became tongue-in-cheek, a grand farce, camp. I pitched the complete opposite, which was totally bring it back to the streets raw, trying to set it in a kind of real reality. No stages, no sets, shooting it all in the inner cities across America, creating a very real feeling. Aronofsky would settle on a more direct adaptation of Frank Miller's Year One comic, and would even team with Miller himself to write the screenplay. Miller's previous work was already an influence on Aronofsky, and the two had developed a working relationship in an attempt to produce a feature adaptation of another Miller story, Ronin. Aronofsky says, My pitch was Death Wish, or The French Connection meets Batman. In year one, Gordon was kind of like Serpico, and Batman was kind of like Travis Bickle. 
The Batman that was out before me was the famous one with the nipples on the bat suit, so I was really trying to undermine that and reinvent it. That's where my head went. While Aronofsky would use the story of Year One as a jumping off point, an apparently legitimate script has since leaked online. What we can see from this script shows significant changes from the Year One comic. The first, most notable change is Bruce Wayne himself. This Bruce is homeless since the death of his parents, and he is taken in by a new character called Big Al, who owns an auto repair shop located in the slums of Gotham. Big Al's son, Little Al, defined in the script as a gigantic early middle-aged black man, will become an Alfred-type mentor figure after Big Al's death. Due to this version of Bruce not having the Wayne fortune, the Batman persona would not be birthed from traveling the world learning how to combat crime, or developed with high-tech equipment like the suit or the Batmobile. Instead, this Bruce would learn his plethora of combat styles from books, and would make his proto-suit using makeshift tools and equipment from the Army-Navy store. This Bruce would also use chemical weapons to fight back against criminals, taking inspiration from chemistry sets he was gifted as a child. He would also lose all his front teeth and replace them with a pair of steel dentures he painted white. Across the street from Al's body shop is a prostitution house called the Cat House. It's here we would meet this iteration of Selina Kyle, a non-white dominatrix, which is much closer to how she is portrayed in the Year One comic than any other versions to date. She can be seen wearing a tight black leather suit, placing handcuffs on a customer. Over the course of the script, she also finds out Bruce's Batman, another change from the comic. James Gordon is much closer to his Year One comic counterpart, but is also just as plagued by suicidal ideation. His introduction scene has him contemplating ending his life with his service revolver in the bathroom, while his wife, Anne, sleeps in the next room. Like the comic, Gordon fights against internal corruption in the police force. But in this script, Commissioner Loeb is the primary antagonist, filling in for crime boss Falcone. At the climax of the film, Batman even goes so far as to stab Loeb in the eye and carve a Z on his face. The film ends with Bruce reclaiming his inheritance, and he and Little Al moving into Wayne Manor. Alleged concept art from pre-production of the unmade film appeared online, seen here. But there is contention around the validity of the work in relation to the project. In 2013, Aronofsky would take to Twitter to denounce it as having nothing to do with Frank or his work. It's possible Warner Brothers commissioned the work without involving Aronofsky and Miller, which is credited to David Williams, who even has the work on his Instagram page. He links it to Aronofsky's project, but it is unclear if Aronofsky signed off on it or not. As for who would play the titular role, rumor was that Aronofsky had wanted Christian Bale, who would, of course, eventually end up being cast, albeit in a different iteration. But as recently as 2020, Aronofsky commented on the casting of Batman. Speaking to Empire, Aronofsky said, The studio wanted Freddie Prince Jr. and I wanted Joaquin Phoenix. I remember thinking, uh-oh, we are making two different films here. That's a true story. It was a different time. The Batman I wrote was definitely a way different type of take than they ended up making. Ironically, while Joaquin Phoenix would not ever be cast as Bruce Wayne, he would later go on to star as and win an Oscar for The Joker in Todd Phillips' 2019 film. Much like Aronofsky's unmade Batman film, Joker would also be a gritty and grounded take on the character and would take inspiration from Martin Scorsese's work. Indeed, it's easy to see this version of Joker living in the same world as Aronofsky's year one. Speaking to the tone of what the script ended up being, Frank Miller said, It was the first time I worked on a Batman project with somebody whose vision of Batman was darker than mine. My Batman was too nice for him. We would argue about it, and I'd say Batman wouldn't do that, he wouldn't torture anybody, and so on. We hashed out a screenplay and we were wonderfully compensated, but then Warner Brothers read it and said, we don't want to make this movie. The executive wanted to do a Batman he could take his kids to, and this was not that. It didn't have the toys in it. The Batmobile was just a tricked out car, and Batman turned his back on his fortune to live a street life so he could know what the people were going through. He built his own Batcave in an abandoned part of the subway, and he created Batman out of whole cloth to fight crime and a corrupt police force. Indeed, it's hard to imagine McDonald's including Bruce's signet ring or the false teeth he wears in Happy Meal. Aronofsky agrees that the death of the project sprung from conflicting interests over the film's tone. I think Warners always knew it would never be something they could make. I think rightfully so, because four-year-olds buy Batman stuff. So if you release a film like that, every four-year-old's going to be screaming at their mother to take them to see it. So they really need a PG property. But there was a hope at one point in the same way that DC Comics puts out different types of Batman titles for different ages, there might be a way of doing the movies at different levels. 
So I was pitching to make an R-rated adult fan-based Batman, a hardcore version that we'd do for not that much money. You wouldn't get any breaks from anyone because it's Warner Brothers and it's Batman, but you could do it for a smart price, raw and edgy, and make it more for fans and adults. Maybe shoot it on Super 16 film and maybe release it after you release the PG one and say, that's for kids, this one's for adults. Miller recalls the studio's reaction to the script. I think I heard a shriek of horror at first. They were shocked at how bold it was and wanted it to be softened as much as it could be. And then we wanted it to be as hard as it could be. In 2002, Aronofsky, Miller, and the studio parted ways. And in 2003, a young up and coming auteur named Christopher Nolan would pitch his take on a year one inspired Batman story. Miller, who would go on to have big screen success with the studio with Sin City, said there were no hard feelings. Aronofsky would then go on to direct many controversial works, including The Fountain, Noah, and Mother. And Miller would also continue his Batman writing, most notably with all-star Batman and Robin, which some fans would argue leans so heavily into self-seriousness it becomes a parody. The work is the birthplace of the now infamous line, Because I'm the goddamn Batman. Elements of the year one script would eventually make their way into future Batman films, likely coincidentally, such as Snyder's 2016 Batman v Superman, which also use a bat branding element, and a Thomas Wayne that fights back against the mugger that kills he and Martha. The upcoming Matt Reeves reboot, The Batman, also shares DNA with this iteration of year one, with a Batmobile that is less high-tech supercar and more homemade souped up muscle car. While Aronofsky and Miller's adaptation of Year One would never make it to the screen, Warner Brothers would eventually hand the Bat franchise reins over to Nolan, who would, of course, go on to direct Batman Begins, which was tonally still grounded, but was more operatic and would also have lighthearted elements and keep the franchise in a more marketable PG-13 range. The film would, of course, become the first film of the Dark Knight trilogy, a critical and commercial powerhouse for the franchise. The Bond franchise would similarly have a grounded reboot, after an outlandish, disappointing prior installment. Much like Batman Begins, Casino Royale would also be critical and commercial success and begin a lauded run of the franchise. Reboots like this would continue to take over Hollywood as we know it, many to a lesser degree of success than Batman and Bond, but the seismic shift in the industry started in earnest when Warner Brothers reached out to an up-and-coming auteur to wipe the slate clean on the nipple-clad Bat franchise. While that pitch would end up being too dark for the studio, the industry would continue to feel the ramifications of the reboot that would occur post-Batman and Robin to this day.